Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yahad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Able and On Air has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists. Welcome to this edition of Able Then On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Lorna Seiler. Arlene's not here today due to um, being in the hospital, but we wish her a speedy recovery. Uh, with us today, we would like to um, say welcome to Senator Ann Watson, who believes um, in the environment, um, that the environment should be cleaner for people with special needs. Welcome, and uh, Senator Ann Watson to Able Then On Air. Well, thank you so much for having me. Okay. Um, let's start here. What is your platform in the environment uh, when it comes uh, to, um, in general, you know, Vermonters? as well as people with special needs. So let's start there. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you. So as far as um, policy around the environment, I uh, believe that, first of all, we need to do the, the hard but right thing up front so that in the long term we uh, can set ourselves up for a healthy uh, 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 living and uh, and it'll save us money in, in the long run. Um, and so I, I know sometimes it can be hard to to do the right thing up front, uh, especially if it's more costly. But uh, but if it is an investment and saves us down the road, then that is the direction that that we got to go and keep that end goal in mind. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is uh, going to be really important, um, not just for. Um, uh, uh, you know, just the, the population in general, but I would say especially uh, for folks who are differently abled um, because they may be more um, more vulnerable or more sensitive to uh, environmental factors. So, uh, What exactly do you mean by environmental factors? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, thinking about, well, just uh, uh, as an example, uh, like the smoke that we've been experiencing from the wildfires um, mm. in Canada, you know, folks with, um, with asthma or breathing, uh, difficulties or, uh, you know, folks who are, are more dependent on oxygen, that kind of thing, uh, you know, they're going to be more sensitive to uh, to particulates in the air. And so, uh, you know, we've got to be uh, doing our part to, um, to fight against climate change uh, to make sure that these wildfires uh, don't happen. Uh, so that's just one example. But, uh, you know, also thinking about, uh, you know, those who might uh, be immunocompromised um, and uh, what exactly do you mean by immunocompromised? Uh, so folks who have um, immune systems who that um, 
uh, maybe have a, a difficult time fighting off uh, diseases, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, as uh, as uh, viruses spread, as as, as the climate changes, uh, we, we might see the, the spread of um, more and different kinds of, of uh, of spread of disease. So, so again, all of these these factors are, are going to impact uh, folks with uh, more vulnerabilities uh, harder. And so, it's it's really important that we are taking care of our environment. Um, our environment trickles down to uh, you know because certain chemicals yeah. uh, have in the past, especially in the seventies, you know. I don't know when you were born, but <laughs> during the 70s and 80s, lead-based paint. Yeah. Uh, kids used to bite their pencils and eat them. <laughs> um, all kinds of, well, you're a teacher, so you should know about that. Oh, yes. <laughs> but but um, it, what can we do to change the environment when it comes to that stuff? Yeah, fair enough. Well, especially about the chemicals that you're talking about. So this last session, we actually had a bill uh, that centered around uh, PFAS or PFOAs. Um, and Which I'm, means? well, that's a good question. I think it's like perfluoral alkaloids or something. It's something like that. Uh, but uh, the these are a class of chemicals that don't degrade in the environment. Like they don't, they don't just decompose uh, like a lot of other um, more naturally occurring chemicals do, and uh, and the the thing is, there are also um, uh, cancer causing, and uh, they they can cause a, a just a range of. Um, uh, have, they can have a, a range of health impacts for, for people, even at low quantities. Uh, and so that, uh, so anyway, we just had a bill about banning um, PFAs in uh, cosmetics and personal care products this last session. Um, you know, because, well, it, it's, it's kind of, uh, I think it's interesting to think about like where we might see co uh, these kinds of chemicals uh, because they are, um, meant to keep things uh, like stain resistant or non-stick or water repellent. Uh, so you might see them in like rugs or on furniture or on uh, any kind of like clothing that's water resistant, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and so it, it turns out that there are PFAs in, in some cosmetics. Um, and so as, especially as they are applied to you know, a person and that we might have a lot of interaction with those chemicals um, if we can keep those free of PFAs, that'll be a, a really good thing. Okay. Um, what, um, in terms, what is your stance uh, with how people, especially, need to take care of themselves and the environment? Can we, uh, if we can be around, around that question. Sure, yeah. Well, you know, as, as far as um, folks with uh, special needs um, taking care of themselves with the environment, I mean, as much as, uh, you know, if, uh, those folks as well as, as anyone can be um, doing the right thing by the environment, that benefits um, all of us. Um, so, you know, just thinking about like how we are um, using energy in our homes or uh, how we are, um, you know, recycling uh, materials. Um, so thinking about using a home. Yeah. Air conditioners, yeah. computers, <laughs> plugs. Um, Montpelier is known in Vermont is known for a lot of power outages, especially mm -hmm. certain times of the year. Mm -hmm. Any thought on that? Because that moves the environment too, if too many people use. Yeah, no, that's a good good question. Um, and especially um, this last winter, we had uh, multiple power outages that lasted a, a really long time, which was, I, I know, really hard for a lot of folks. Uh, so one of the things that I am looking into, well, not just my, myself, but uh, the, the legislature uh, is, is looking into uh, the use of battery storage to potentially extend uh, the supply of power, even when power outages happen. Um, and we also made it easier this last session for uh, uh, electric utilities
properties to bury power lines uh, by giving them some exemptions to um, Act 250 to get their their power lines um, closer to the road, so out of the forests, um, out of the the wilder wilderlands, um, and so onto the what road. What do you mean Act 250? Explain. So Act 250 is. Um, a uh, permitting process that uh, gets triggered um, for certain types of development. And like if a, if a development is, is too big or, um, again, if it's certain types of activities, uh, then you'd have to get an Act 250 permit. And uh, so we've uh, modified those regulations to make it easier for utility companies to get those lines closer to the road and to bury them so they should be less affected by um, severe weather events, which I think will be a really good thing. Um, you know, one of the things that we heard from electric companies uh, was that uh, uh, of the uh, the most uh, damaging storms that they've had to deal with, um, they had multiple just in this last season, and that is not normal. Um, some of the worst storms they've had in the last 10 years uh, occurred this last year. Uh, so, you know, we, we see climate change happening. We see it, it getting worse and it making our, our weather events more extreme. And uh, so as much as we can be preparing uh, for that, that future as well as trying to uh, reduce our contribution to it in terms of reducing our carbon, um, the better. Reducing carbon, explain. Yeah, sure. So uh, when we burn... Uh, fuels like uh, oil or propane or natural gas um, and even uh, you know wood uh, that is uh, that fuel itself is a form of carbon and when you burn it it releases that carbon into the atmosphere and carbon acts like a blanket you know like when you're cold at night and you want, you want more blankets to keep you warm carbon acts like a blanket for the atmosphere and so heat can come in through um, you know, solar rays, but then it sort of gets trapped here. And so it ultimately um, raises the, the temperature of, of the Earth on a global scale. Uh, not as much heat can, uh, can escape. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's one of the reasons why we, we talk about global warming or climate change um, is a result uh, pretty directly of uh, the additional carbon in the atmosphere uh, that has not been in the atmosphere for uh, millions of years in, in some cases. Uh, so uh, if, and if you look at the, the trend of, of carbon in the atmosphere over time, it's, it's um, it's short. It's shot up uh, in the last hundred years, and uh, so we've we've got to. We talked about flattening the curve uh, with co with uh, COVID, and we've got to we've got to not just flatten the curve, but uh, get it to to bend downwards as well mm. um, with carbon. Do you think COVID had too much to do with the environment messing up? Example: Well, environmentally, uh, you know, when services close. Yeah. Okay, medical services close, things happen. Um, hospitals congregate people. I mm -hmm. think I'm saying it right. Am I saying it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They congregate yeah, yeah. people uh, in one ward mm -hmm. or two wards, or sometimes years ago, institutions for people with disabilities used to do that. Mm -hmm. with, beds one on top of another and mm. people get sick yeah that messes up the environment also mm. Can you explain well that's that's an interesting I don't mean to bring up years ago but it's no no fair enough well I don't know much about that particular um, situation because it sounds like you know if they were trying to uh, if they had reduced staff and so they were you know bringing folks um, together to make it easier but I can see that that would ultimately uh, you know be worse for the patients um, and that that would be that would be really tough mm -hmm. um, well, one of the other staff to go around exactly yeah for sure uh, and we're certainly seeing that in industries uh, around the state in a, a variety of, of sectors, unfortunately, there's just a, a huge need for, for more people. Um, but, but it's interesting you bring up, you know, the connection between COVID and the environment. Uh, because Am I wrong for bringing it up? 
Oh no, not at all. No, it's because it's super. I think it's super interesting. Actually, uh, one of the effects that we saw is that uh, uh, because a lot of <laughs> people were staying home, basically, uh, driving dropped. Right, and so. Uh, Transportation has been uh, one of the has been the biggest single uh, polluting sector in terms of carbon uh, in Vermont, mm -hmm. and we actually saw a, a huge dip in that. the The data just came out uh, about our, our carbon emissions through well, when the last. People, like myself, when people ride bikes mm -hmm. and uh, like. I'm learning to ride a bike again. So when people ride bikes and they don't get in a car, then yeah, yeah, right, exactly, yeah. So uh, so the the transport the carbon related to or coming from transportation has uh, dropped in Vermont uh, since uh, since COVID, which I think is super interesting. And we're not sure now that COVID is winding down. Uh, is it really? Well, it's less than it was, I suppose. Maybe we're all just testing less. Where people are certainly treating it like it's uh, like it's winding down, anyways. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if uh, any of the effects from the reduced uh, trans carbon from transportation uh, is if if that reduction is uh, sticking around at all. Now, I, I suspect it will come back up a little bit, but I don't know. It may not go back up to the level that it was before COVID. We'll we'll just have to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Uh, let's see. Well, littering and yeah. trash yeah. is part of the environment. Mm -hmm. Has it gotten better in Vermont? Has it not getting better? Has it? Um, Ha, has it gotten better? Well, that's a good question. I, I don't know um, data around littering, uh, but we did this session pass a revised version of what's called the bottle bill. Mm. Uh, you might be familiar that uh, people can- Five cents. Five cents, yes, get your five cents by taking your, your bottle back. Uh, but I think it's- It uh, upped it to 10 cents or something. Uh, no, well, it, it kept it at five cents, but you might, or a lot of Vermonters might know that you can get uh, five cents back for your soda or for a, a beer can, but not for like a bottle of water. Uh, that there's, or, or like- Change that? Well, so the, the bottle bill that passed the legislature would have expanded the eligible kinds of bottles, right? It would have included wine bottles, Water bottles and um, and other kinds of juice. Um, and I know kind of people thing. that have paid their rent just on oh. bottle recycling. Well, so I, I need to say though that the governor just vetoed that bill. Mm -hmm. uh, which I think is unfortunate because uh, those are, I think that would have helped uh, motivate uh, f folks to keep those bottles out of, uh, out of the streams and sides of the roads and whatnot. You know, those are maybe um, some of the, the kinds of um, bottles that we're seeing, in addition to beer cans for sure, other kinds of bottles, but it would have been an additional motivator to, to help uh, bring that material back. And uh, we, what we have, what we heard uh, in testimony was that uh, places that have uh, redemption, uh, bottle redemption for things like uh, wine bottles um, and other kinds of glass, that glass has a higher likelihood of getting uh, to be recycled back into, uh, back into glass. Um, for, for a higher uh, purpose. Uh, it's, a, it's just a higher quality product. Well, glass right. bottles such as wine, wine bottles are 15 cents from what I heard. Uh, I, I'd have to go back and look, but um, uh, yeah, this would have, because I know like liquor bottles are, are 15 um, cents, but I'm not sure about wine, so. Um, now, you know, Learning disabilities and, and, and other challenges. Um, uh, years ago, they had something called, um, uh, what is that, sludge or, or other chemicals that mm -hmm. come out of, you know, um, 
uh, the environment because if you if you if you like lakes and, and different things, uh, if you don't clean it up, it gets all yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. How how are we doing as Vermonters with that part of the environment? Like really cleaning up like chemical spills. Have, has has Vermont ever had a chemical spill that really messed up the environment? Yeah. Well, actually, that's a good question. So I'm trying to think of which organization had this map, but I remember seeing uh, a map that had all of the sites in Vermont that there had been some kind of a spill or uh, was it a oil toxic spill? Yeah, right. Um, I think I'm saying a sludge, oil sludgy mess. Yeah. Well, there's, uh, I know there's, there's been a lot of contamination like with PFAs uh, down in, uh, in Bennington County um, from a, a company that that used to be there uh, and there are uh, there are all there's a bunch of different sites all around um, Vermont uh, so I, I'm ha I'd be happy to send you a link to that map uh, if I could recall what organization um, had it but the the other thing that might be worth mentioning is uh, right now. Uh, no, this is not quite your question, but uh, one of the effects of uh, a lot of, uh, or I should say, too much phosphorus going into our, our waterways um, ends up creating uh, uh, bacteria blooms. Sometimes the uh, like the beach in uh, it, some of the beaches in. Um, at Lake Champlain get closed because of uh, contamination with bacteria uh, as a result of uh, either too much nitrogen or too much phosphorus uh, going into uh, going into the lake, and uh, so we are continually uh, looking to uh, uh, put money into uh, helping both point source and farms uh, clean up uh, clean up that that kind of contamination um, so that well, those what do you mean by clean up exactly yeah so being able to contain runoff uh, so it, just as an example uh, there are it's so like in the city of Montpelier there are places where um, in heavy rainstorm events. Oh, that um, big, huge rainstorm we had the other day. <laughs> well, so sure, like that. I'm not sure that there was much contamination specifically from that, but sometimes there are uh, rain events where, uh, because we have a combined uh, sewer and water overflow system, um, sometimes uh, if, the, if the volume of water is too much, the sewer can sometimes overflow into the river. Mm -hmm. And so those come from specific points, so those might be um, considered point sources. And uh, so, you know, the city of Montpelier, as well as uh, uh, the legislature, uh, have tried to put money towards cleaning up those particular um, sites, right, where that that is a, a kind of contamination. Mm -hmm. but. But also, you know, farms uh, often, if they have uh, manure that is running off into the streams, then that is also a, a kind of a, an, an additional um, phosphorus source. So what you're saying is we don't have enough sewers? Well, what I'm saying is that was, uh, in some cases, particularly where the sewer systems might be uh, uh, combined with our, our stormwater systems, they just need to be redesigned and re rebuilt. Um, not necessarily more, uh, but uh, but these connection points changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I'm not exactly understanding what the connection points are. Oh, sure. Well, so... I'm uh, sorry. No, you're fine. It's, it's actually um, not... Super easy to explain necessarily, but there are points where uh, the like the storm drains that you might see that collect water from the um, from the road might be connected to the sewer system that goes to uh, a wastewater treatment plant. Mm -hmm. uh, but if that gets if that sewer gets so full of rainwater um, that it can't handle the volume of rainwater, then it might come out those storm drains. Does that make uh, sense? That makes sense. Yes. Right. Um, now, um, I know we talked about learning disabilities, but in years past, um, people with birth defects, I mean severe yeah. birth defects, uh, you know, because, uh, let me see if I can rephrase this. 
when you live in a place that doesn't have running water, yeah, or doesn't have proper sewage system, or shall we say, um, I think I'm saying it right, food deprived or mm, mm-hmm. or food desert, food, food deserts, desert. yes, you, food right, desert. right. Um, that really messes up the environment. Yeah. Uh, how are we? Um, really caring about the environment if these things do exist. Can we really change the environment before it's too late? Well, I, that's, um, uh, it's a great question. Is um, it long-winded? No, it's fine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you know, I, uh, it's, I feel like your question is like a, a, a philosophical one as well as a scientific one. And I mean, I certainly live my life in a way that I always uh, will choose to hope. Uh, and well, you're a vegetarian, correct? Oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I should be probably, but I am not a vegetarian. Um, but you know, that if I, if I, if I were, I would probably have less of a carbon footprint myself. Mm-hmm. Um, so probably a direction that I, I probably should go. Uh, but you know, that's one of the things like if people can eat um if they don't necessarily need uh to eat meat every day uh but but protein is really important <laughs> so uh, making sure that no but the, <laughs> the environment food desert yeah that too. yeah for sure well so you know when we think about how we need to be uh, changing our relationship with with the land uh to have a healthy uh habitat and for uh species beyond just humans i mean that affects how we're using land. It also affects how we are feeding ourselves and, uh, and certainly uh, our, our relationships with each other and our relationships with, uh, with food, right? So I, I realize I just said a, a, whole, a whole lot of things, but in order to have a healthy relationship with the environment, we need to be taking care of each other um, as well. And that means having healthy food systems uh, because if we are feeding... <laughs> Uh, if if we are um, uh, doing wrong by our by our own bodies, then that is also going to harm the environment as well. Because and and vice versa, the the practices um, of uh, like industrialized agriculture, like burning out the soil with too much fertilizer, that's an unsustainable practice. And so we need to. Ha- um, have more whole foods, uh, more organic foods in our diet, uh, which is going to take care of our bodies uh, better, and it will take care of the environment better as well. But that doesn't address the the issue that you're speaking about in terms of food deserts. Um, in order, <laughs> I've actually heard that uh, per acre, mm-hmm. um, organic farms that have a high diversity of products can actually be more, um, can have a higher uh, yield per acre than just regular uh, conventional industrialized agriculture. Um, what exactly do you mean about that? Yeah, so um, monocultures or growing just one thing uh, for multiple acres, uh, that is it's bad for uh, habitats, it's bad for pollinators, it's, um, it's bad for resilience, uh, it's bad for the soil. Uh, so, but that is how a lot of our food is grown in, in monocultures, um, which really just, uh, just in terms of the words, I mean, mono just means one, right? So it's like growing one thing um, in, a, in a large space. Uh, so as much as we can be uh, buying local whole foods, um, lo- not, not necessarily the chain, but like local, uh, uh, you know, more just fundamental ingredients, um, really the, the better. And we need to make sure that those are available to people in all, in all places, especially in, uh, well, in, in every town or in every, um, city. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the environment and, like I said, the food desert, mm-hmm. do you think Vermont has enough uh, food pantries or do we need more? How, how would that play into the environment? Yeah, that's a good question. So. Uh, 
It, it certainly seems to me that we could um, have more food pantries. Um, and certainly, um, for food security is an issue for a lot of folks, uh, certainly. And as, as we also certainly saw during the, the pandemic. Um, and you know, so as much as we can be ensuring that people are getting enough food and um, enough nutritious food, uh, th that I think is going to be um, really important for having uh, a healthy society. Um, so yeah, we could absolutely use more food pantries. So but you, really, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say you, you're using this ter term food desert, and I wonder if folks know what a food desert is. Okay, so what is a food desert? <laughs> sure. So um, uh, I would say it is an an area where um, there's probably a technical definition that I don't know, but um, it's an area where it's not easy to get to a grocery store. Yeah. Is, yeah. Does Vermont have, like, I know some people in our state don't have access to a phone, don't mm, have access to mm -hmm. a computer, don't even have access to call GMTA. Yeah. In a rural in part of Vermont. Yeah. So, um, I know Cabot has like one grocery store. Yeah. And, uh, Sure. Well, and I also want to speak to the Meals on Wheels program. I know um, a lot of folks uh, depend on the Meals on Wheels or benefit from the Meals on Wheels program. Uh, and, uh, you know, I have so much respect for all of the organizations and volunteers that provide that uh, service, uh, which I, I know is really uh, valuable to a lot of folks. And so as much as uh, we can be supporting um, the, those uh, groups and volunteers, I think the better. I was actually really uh, disheartened to hear that in this last legislative budget, the Meals on Wheels program um, amount of funding was reduced. And so, reduced. yes, yeah. So I would actually, so I'm, I'll be looking to see that in the next budget that we uh, restore funding for the Meals on Wheels program. Um, so in, in, in the meanwhile, uh, yeah, this well, would. Now, I know, for example, speaking about food desert, mm -hmm. um, Children and free reduced lunch. Yeah. Let's talk. Well, you're a teacher. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, some kids don't have the means to pay for yeah. that lunch. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, free lunches. Well, they're not. Well, some of them you have to pay. Uh, how can we change that? as a food uh, situation? Well, I've actually got some good news on that front, uh, which is that this last session, uh, well, actually, let's, let's back up. During COVID, uh, there was a, a program for schools that uh, student, students didn't have to pay for meals, um, regardless of like proving that they, uh, you know, had a, you know, income hardship um, in their homes. So f meals were, were free for all kids, uh, which was great. Uh, and so that program uh, was, was sort of ending. And I think one of the great successes of this last legislative session was that uh, we passed a universal school meals uh, program. So that, that it makes that program permanent uh, moving forward, which I think makes a lot of sense. You know, when kids are in school and they have to go to the nurse, right? Like they, we don't charge them um, to go to the nurse. It's oh, just, start to do it? oh no, no, no. I am certainly not suggesting that. Um, but the, the good thing thing is that um yeah, that that is a, a, a service that's available to kids because we understand that being well is a prerequisite for their ability to learn, right? So that uh, that they are um, ready to learn when they are back in the classroom, uh, and it, and really eating is a part of wellness. And so if uh, if kids are going hungry at lunchtime or if they haven't had breakfast, then their ability to learn is going to be reduced. And so um, this eliminates that as a barrier um, for kids uh, being ready and able to learn, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is going to be um, really wonderful. So let's talk about um, quickly because we have some couple of minutes. Um, the recent legislative session. Yes. What did you? I know it's not open to the public, but what important 
things are important to Vermonters that you... That we passed. Yeah. Well, I, first of all, I do want to make sure that folks know that it is available to the public. Um, no, well, you can't go... I was told that you, the State House, during the legislative session, we can't go listen to stuff, can we? Oh, no, you totally can. Um, so you can come... Um, sit in on any of the meetings and uh, sit in the back on the floor like when we're um, when we're on the floor you can sit in the back I think if you if you we wanted to speak. right you can't speak right unless you are called on to speak um, but generally it doesn't happen on the floor um, and it's up to the chair if it's if we're talking about committee and if you wanted to film um, then you I think you probably just have to get some kind of special arrangement to to record so what did you what did you talk about that's important? Thank you. Yes. Uh, well, so we've talked a lot about the environment on the show so far. Uh, we did pass uh, something called uh, the Clean Heat Standard or the Affordable Heat Act uh, this past session that designs a program but doesn't move forward with it until we have more information. Uh, but that program will help make it easier for folks to get off of carbon. It will re significantly reduce the costs to, uh, of non-fossil fuel heating systems, which I think is going to be really uh, helpful for us to reduce our, our statewide carbon footprint. Um, so that's one thing uh, that I think is really important. Um, another, uh, did you want to say something about that? Okay. Well, so um, another thing that I know had uh, come up especially recently was the ending of the motel uh, voucher program that had been in place through COVID. Now, to be fair, uh, it was the, the motel program had existed prior to that. It was just not open to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and COVID opened it to everyone. Um, and so one of the things, there, there was actually a bill uh, this, this past session about adult uh, protective services. Mm -hmm. um, and to, attached to that, we were People able with to- with disabilities or? Yeah, for folks with, uh, actually, I think it calls out uh, vulnerable uh, Vermonters. Mm -hmm. So that includes folks with uh, disabilities, but it also also includes um, folks that uh, are receiving some kind of um, services uh, in their their um, uh, you know like a like health services in their home or if they are um, in a residential kind of like care facility that kind of thing. Uh, but attached to that, we were able to uh, extend the motel program uh, for for those who are were still there until they are able to to find a place. Of, a more permanent place to live, uh, which I, I think is really um, helpful and important, and I think has set us up to look at homelessness in a, a higher priority way for um, the next session to hopefully come up with some more long-term um, solutions. Uh, we did also pass um, uh, the, the Homes Bill, the um, Housing Opportunities Made for Everyone, um, which uh, we, we believe will help um, reduce some of the regulatory barriers uh, to building more housing, which we know is uh, a, a crisis in Vermont, for sure. Um, and we were also able to pass some significant gun legislation, uh, uh, including a 72-hour waiting period and uh, extending... But, um, really quick, um, not to... Uh, long ago, I had um, Senator uh, Rebecca Ballant before oh, she became yeah. before she became uh, House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. We talked about the gun legislation that, in a sense, messes up the environment um, in terms of you know people with special needs having access to guns. Sure. Uh, because President Obama. Um, before he left uh, Washington, he passed part of a, a bill where if your social security or your government benefit is used for mental health mm -hmm. situations, you can't get a gun. Mm. They may, you know, mm -hmm. so if you're, if you're um, mentally Mm -hmm. Challenged, sure. You shouldn't have a gun in any way. Mm -hmm. so, that, mm -hmm. um, 
so we talked about how to make it more harder for someone um, getting gun, you know, mm -hmm. getting a, a mm -hmm. firearm. Mm -hmm. Is that um, one of the things in the legislature that um, you know is, that you're dealing with as far as people? Getting firearms that you right. shouldn't have. Right. Yeah. So we, we so like I, I mentioned, we did pass a 72-hour waiting period. Uh, this was really a part of a like a suicide prevention package. So that was just one um, one aspect of it. Another aspect was. Uh, uh, ex uh, extending to families the ability to get a, um, I'm forgetting the, the phrase, uh, uh, like an extended protective order uh, or something like that, uh, where uh, that would it would help prevent um, folks that are uh, perhaps at higher risk of suicide um, from accessing uh, guns. So <clears throat> that, that I think will be good as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so there, there were a number of, of uh, uh, pieces that were, I, th I think, helpful um, to reduce gun violence, because Vermont has a, has a high suicide rate. Um, Does that, how are you doing with your environment with that, because that's, Different is that a different topic altogether, but does that deal with the environment in some way? Well, that's a good question. Um, I guess I think of it usually as, as a separate issue, but uh, you know, I, I certainly could see it as related in that you know, I, I did actually, um, I've, I've had students who, uh, who were depressed, basically, um, in large part because of all of the difficulties that we're having with the environment. Um, and so I you know I could see a connection in that in that way, um, but but you know hoping that um, that we can that is that we, we still have time to turn things around and that we're going to do our best to uh, to do right by the environment. Well, okay. Um, I would like to uh, thank you for joining us yeah. on this edition of Able to On Air. For more information, where should people? Contact you. Uh, so my uh, email is probably the best way for folks to get in touch with me, and that is uh, available on the, the state's website. Um, I could also just tell folks right now it's a Watson at ledge state dot vt dot us. Um, okay. Uh, well. Uh, Thank you for joining me on this edition of Ableton On Air. Yeah. And uh, for more information also on uh, Ableton On Air, you can go to www.orcamedia.net. Um, for any um, topics that we've discussed today or in the future, uh, you can go to www.orcamedia.net. I'm Lauren Seiler. Arlene's not here. Um, we wish her a speedy recovery. Uh, we thank our sponsors, Washington County Mental Health, and many others that have um, supported Able Than I Am. Um, I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time. Major sponsors for Able Than On Air include Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Able Than On Air include Parchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Able Than On Air has been seen 
in the following publications. Barchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists.